They died because they starved. They died because they had nothing to eat and nothing to drink. You've probably seen pictures of these people who have suffered from starvation and malnourishment. <laughs> they seem so frail, so exhausted, so skinny, and the immediate response would be to categorize fasting into the same camp with starvation. We're running really low on everything. We're practically starving here. However, there's a huge difference between caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, and starvation. Starving. I'm gonna tell you right away that fasting doesn't make you starve and it doesn't lead to malnourishment. You. By practically, you mean not really. But it doesn't mean that you can't starve while fasting. I'm so hungry. In this video, I'm gonna tell you how to avoid the starvation mode while fasting and how to not mess up your fast. Yeah, that's his stomach eating itself. First of all, we have to come to terms that intermittent fasting and caloric restriction, they have a ton of health benefits for both your body and your mind. Numerous studies have shown that caloric restriction increases the lifespan and youthfulness of almost all species, starting with fruit flies and ending with rhesus monkeys. In humans, there's no definite anti-aging proof, but fasting's been shown to improve biomarkers, reduce inflammation, promote stem cell growth, boost the immune system and make you burn a ton of fat. However, to successfully gain all these benefits, you have to avoid starvation and malnutrition. This monkey here is from our restricted group, he's about 25 years old. And the other monkey is from our control group and he's about 26 years old. You can see the restricted animal is much thinner, his coat looks really nice, he just has a younger looking appearance. Compared to the control animal, his coat is a little scraggly, he's obviously heavier, he's got a... <laughs> He just looks less healthy and older than the restricted animal. So what's the difference between caloric restriction, fasting and starvation? Starvation is a severe deficiency in energy intake. The body doesn't have access to essential nutrients and is slowly wasting away by cannibalizing its vital organs. It's a gradual process of degradation that's often characterized by the skinny fat look or the bloated stomach which is caused by insufficient protein even in the presence of sufficient caloric intake. Caloric restriction reduces calorie intake without causing malnutrition or starvation. You're simply consuming fewer calories needed to maintain your body's current energy demands. This will make you burn stored fat and also lowers the body's overall metabolic rate, down-regulates reproductive hormones, thyroid functioning and promotes gluconeogenesis. The difference between caloric restriction and starvation is that when you're consuming fewer calories, your body still gets access to its daily energy demands. The difference is that those energy demands, they have drastically lowered and your metabolism has become more efficient in terms of gaining energy per calorie. Fasting is a state of metabolic suspension in which you're not consuming any calories. Despite that, your body still is nourished and gets the energy it needs. This happens by shifting into ketosis, in which you'll be burning your body fat almost exclusively. The first days of fasting ketosis are characterized by slightly higher rates of gluconeogenesis, but this decreases drastically after two to three days because ketones are very protein sparing. You won't become deficient in micronutrients either because the essential ones are already stored in your body to a certain amount. Fasting doesn't equal starvation because your body is in a distinct metabolic state. Being fasted and being fed, they're quite binary. Even consuming very small amounts of food will shift you from a fasted state into a fed condition. Fasting isn't the same as caloric restriction either because you can be consuming fewer calories without ever entering into a fasted state. If you eat less calories, but you do it more frequently, then you will of course, then you can get into ketosis, but you may not be able to get the other health benefits of fasting. One of the most important ones is autophagy. Autophagy is your cell's self-digestive mechanism that recycles old, worn-out cell components and converts them back into energy. It's a catabolic state that kills off cancerous cells and it's needed for longevity of the brain and muscle tissue. In fact, the life extension benefits of fasting are linked to autophagy. In one study with mice and flies, they found that if you inhibited autophagy but still fed the animals fewer calories, they didn't live longer, but the ones who were proficient at causing autophagy did live longer. This is a very important point because it means that you can be consuming fewer calories and practically stay in this semi-starvation state without ever shifting into autophagy and gaining the longevity benefits. No! So how do you not mess this up? 
To raise autophagy, you need to suppress mTOR and insulin. Current research shows that even as little as 50 calories or 2 to 3 grams of leucine will inhibit autophagy, but these results aren't conclusive by any means. Autophagy happens in different tissues in different degrees, and it's not as binary as it might think. There are even some compounds that promote autophagy, like green tea, ginger, ginseng, turmeric and coffee. Generally speaking, if your insulin and protein synthesis are low, you'll begin to show more signs of autophagy by shifting from an anabolic state into a more catabolic one. So, to prevent malnutrition and starvation, you want to establish ketosis and autophagy as soon as possible while fasting. The consequences to that may be very severe and long term. Really? During World War II, they conducted a study called the Minnesota Starvation Experiment on a group of lean men who reduced their calories by 45% for 6 months. Their diet consisted of primarily carbohydrates, which comprised 77% of total calories, and they were fed very few protein to mimic starvation conditions. They ate potatoes, cabbage, macaroni, whole wheat bread, while still maintaining their active lifestyle. After the experiment, the men showed a 21% reduction in strength, decline in energy and vitality. One of them even started having dreams about cannibalism. We must stop. Therefore, if you want to do intermittent fasting for the health benefits, then you don't want to mess it up by kicking yourself out of ketosis and inhibiting autophagy. This will only really begin to happen if your liver glycogen stores have been depleted and you're switching into ketosis which takes at least 16 to 24 hours. Autophagy starts to really ramp up after 48 hours, and to get a really good response, you'd have to be in this fasted state for up to 3 to 5 days. All we have to do is make them last the rest of our lives. The biggest mistake you could be making is to raise mTOR and insulin just enough to inhibit autophagy. I think I'll eat it now! <laughs> <sighs> But this just enough is gonna kick you out of a fasted state and it's gonna maintain this malnourishment. I think I'll eat it now! <laughs> oh! In fact, you would be better off by avoiding all calories altogether so you could drive yourself into deeper ketosis. We can't eat stomach food! That's why the men in this starvation experiment lost all their muscle mass. They were fed a little bit of food, but it wasn't enough to prevent them from starving. Autophagy is actually needed to maintain lean muscle mass and it makes your body more able to protect itself against excessive catabolism. Well, starve then! So how do you avoid the starvation mode? Whenever you're trying to lose fat or reduce calories, then you need to accompany it with a period of zero caloric intake when you allow autophagy to kick in. Here are a few guidelines to remember. Fast for at least 16 to 20 hours almost every day as to deplete your liver glycogen and keep yourself in mild ketosis. Don't consume any calories during your fasting window. Doing juice cleanses, having a piece of fruit, taking BCAAs, exogenous ketones, bulletproof coffee, they're all most likely going to inhibit autophagy or at least slow it down. Compounds like green tea and coffee in small amounts are fine because they elevate both ketones and autophagy. You don't want to be adding any milk, sugar, oils or artificial sweeteners because they'll probably kick you out of a fasted state. The safest bet is to simply drink water with salt. Balancing your electrolytes with sodium and magnesium salts will keep cortisol in check and prevent muscle cramps. Dry fasting can actually boost autophagy even more than regular water fasting. The reason is that your body will enter into a fasted state quicker and starts converting your body fat into hydrogen and calories. <laughs> Whenever you do eat, try to maintain lower levels of insulin and blood sugar. Carbs and protein alone will raise mTOR and suppress autophagy, but if you eat more fats with them, then you'll keep yourself in a semi-fasted state. Also, you should start eating these compounds I mentioned earlier, like ginger, turmeric and ginseng. You should also have extended fasts that last for 3-5 to five days a few times per year. This is needed for gaining any significant benefit from autophagy. I personally aim for a 3-5 to five day fast every quarter and a 24 hour fast every week. You took my only food! Now I'm gonna starve! Autophagy definitely isn't the end-all be-all for health and longevity. Of course, all of us would need to recycle our systems and cleanse ourselves, but 
We need to first treat the cause, not symptoms. You have to focus on eating a diet that doesn't cause excessive inflammation and accumulate these toxins into your body. Overall, you should still aim for eating fewer calories. Caloric restriction and lower metabolic rate are still associated with longevity and anti-aging benefits. The longest living organisms don't burn a ton of calories, but they're still very efficient with the way they produce energy. But if you feed yeast cells less, they live longer. So do nematode worms, fruit flies, and even rodents. It seems that semi-starvation extends lifespan. There is definitely a trade-off between eating too many calories and living longer. Exercising, consuming food, converting it into ATP, digesting it, eliminating the waste, and storing fuel all require energy and they tax the mitochondria. Even breathing and elevated heart rate cause mild oxidative stress to the body and are slowly killing you. <coughs> That's why you shouldn't be thinking of how many calories I can burn or how many calories I can eat without getting fat because it's making you less efficient with the way you produce energy. Instead, you should aim for energy suspension in the form of frequent intermittent fasting where you allow autophagy to do its work. Me so hungry. But to prevent malnourishment, you have to follow it up with adequate nutrition in the feeding phase where you consume more calories and you get enough of the micronutrients. <laughs> If you want to learn how to master the art of intermittent fasting and feasting by combining the ketogenic diet with IF, then check out my program Keto IF. It includes a meal plan, a fasting schedule and over 50 recipes. But thanks for watching this video, make sure you don't mess up your fast. <coughs> Click the like, subscribe, notification bell as well like always, my name is Seem. Stay fat adapted, stay empowered. I'm